Okay, we're going to the movies this morning. <laughs> we're going to talk about a, a, a really sweet little movie from 2015 called Inside Out. Now, we showed the movie here on Friday for those who wanted to see it for the first time or maybe even for the third or the fourth time or the fifth time. I'm looking at you, Deborah. Fifth time, sixth time, whatever it happens to be. How many have seen the movie? Okay, we got a lot of folks who are familiar with the plot here. And uh, don't worry, you don't need to have seen it in order to make sense of what I'm going to be talking about today, or at least that's my, my intention. Uh, Inside Out is the story of a young girl named Riley and the voices inside of her head. Now, don't worry, it's not those kind of voices. More precisely, these are the... Uh, these are the voices that we all have inside of our heads in the form of our emotions. Now, for those who haven't seen the movie, and as a review for those who have, I want to show a two-minute trailer that is going to give you a really good idea of what it's all about, I think. So here we go. Riley, how was the first day of school? Fine, I guess. Did you guys pick up on that? Sure. Mm -hmm. yeah, something's wrong. Signal the husband. <clears throat> Uh-oh, she's looking at us. What did she say? Oh, sorry, sir. No one was listening. Is it garbage night? Uh, we left the toilet seat up. What is it, woman? What? <laughs> Riley's emotions. These are Riley's memories. They're mostly happy, you'll notice, not to brag. I wanted to maybe hold one. What happened? Sadness? She did something to the memory. Is everything okay? I don't know. Take it back, Joy. It's great. Joy, no. Let's Wait. Go. The core memories. Ah! No, 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 no. <laughs> Can I say the curse word now? <laughs> We have a major problem. Oh, I wish Joy was here. We can fix this. We just have to get back to headquarters. That's long-term memory. You could get lost in there. Think positive. Okay. I'm positive you will get lost in there. <laughs> Who's that? Was it there? There's no bears in San Francisco. I saw a really hairy guy. He looked like a bear. <laughs> This is huge! Imagination land? No way. Dream production? Rainbow Unicorn, she's right there! I loved you in Fairy Dream Adventure Part 7. Okay, bye. I love you. We can't focus on what's going wrong. There's always a way to turn things around. It's Brock Wade! Congratulations, San Francisco! You've ruined pizza! <laughs> high points there. Wasn't that interesting? And I know what some of you might be thinking, gee, don't we have more than five emotions? Well, probably. In fact, I read someplace that they considered something like 27 different emotions. And then they remembered, of course, that this is a movie that kids need to understand as well as adults, and it's only 90 minutes long, so five it is, and they work and they work perfectly well. I mean, no one, no one is saying that this movie is a, a perfect analogy for how the brain works. It's a sweet metaphor is what it is. They got some things right and probably some things wrong. And if you are interested in what a, a neurologist has to say about it, I've given you a link. It's in the handout in your bulletin. It's an article written by Dr. Stephen Novella, and he loved the movie. And he also talks about the things that it got right and the things that it got wrong. And really none of that matters in the end because overall the message is, is spot on. The basic idea here is that our personality and our behavior are shaped by the important experiences in life. 
and the emotions and the core memories that go along with those experiences. Those core memories, which is a big deal in this movie, the core memories can become colored by the emotions, either alone or in combination. So here are the emotions again from inside out and their colors. And we had some fun, by the way, Friday night afterwards during the discussion trying to figure out what the color connection was all about here. So first, there's Joy, played by the irrepressible Amy Poehler. And joy is yellow, and I think the general consensus was that yellow is, is sunny, it's high energy, it's, it's bright, and that's exactly what joy is, a sunny yellow. And for Riley, joy is the dominant emotion, probably because Riley has had a happy life. She's a fortunate child, she was born to loving parents who live in a beautiful suburban neighborhood in Minnesota where there are ponds for ice skating and hockey and forests and things like that all around. Then we have Sadness, who's played by Phyllis Smith. And of course, Sadness is blue. How could it be any other way? That makes a lot of sense, blue. But the next character, Fear, who's played by Bill Hader, Fear is purple, and we had to sit down and think, well, what exactly does purple have to do with fear? And we thought, well, you know what happens sometimes when you stop breathing or you stop hyperventilating? What do they say happens to you? You turn purple. So fear, who, and you'll see he hyperventilates in the movie and different things all the time, he stops breathing. When you're afraid, you stop breathing, you turn purple. I guess that, <clears throat> I guess that works. Okay, next is disgust played by Mindy Kaling, discussed as green, and uh, we talked about that one a little bit too, and uh, the first thought we had was that, um, well, green is closely related to envy and jealousy, which are closely related to disgust. That makes sense, and then we also thought that, well, you know, when someone gets disgusted sometimes, what happens? Well, they might, they might throw up, right? And what do they say about people just before they throw up? They're turning green. green. Okay, that might work. That's a little bit disgusting, I guess, but uh, that works. And finally, my favorite of the bunch, <laughs> Anger, played by the always hilarious foul mouth, may I say, and perpetually angry sounding Lewis Black. And of course, anger is flaming, raging red. Okay, so as I said before, joy is Riley's dominant emotion. And again, because her earliest memories were happy. You know, think what might have happened if her childhood hadn't been so happy. There could be some other emotion that is dominant because of that. But uh, for Riley, it's joy. And one of her earliest memories was playing hockey with her parents, and she scored a goal, and of course she loved the sport of hockey ever since. So, an important part of her personality is made up of hockey. It's symbolized by something called hockey islands. And so the other islands that make up Riley's personality are goofball island, friendship, honesty, and family. Those are the important ones. Those are the ones that make up her personality. But then something happens in Riley's life that isn't so joyful. Her father gets a new job in San Francisco. She moves from the wide open suburbs of Minnesota to the city and city life in San Francisco from a sprawling suburban home to one of those funky old row houses where she's greeted by a foul odor and a dead rat. <laughs> no forests, no ponds. It's almost like living in a foreign country. So Riley, and of course her emotions, have to struggle to adjust to a new life, new home, new school, new friends. And Riley is sad. She's sad, but she tries to put on a happy face in order to win her mother's approval. And of course, that's the work of joy. Joy never wants Riley to feel sad. And one of the big messages of this movie is that that is just not realistic. We can't be joyful, as Karen said at the top of the service. Are you feeling alive, awake, enthusiastic, and joyous about your life? Well, it's good to be able to do that, but that's not always possible. It's not always realistic. Life isn't always Blissful. So up in the control room, in Riley's head, 
Sadness is trying to operate the controls because this is kind of a sad time. And sadness ends up touching some of Riley's core memories, turning them from happy to sad. And this causes joy to freak out. So joy draws a circle on the floor with a piece of chalk and tells sadness to stand in that, this is your new job, stand in the circle, don't touch anything. But of course, sadness can't help herself as soon as the other emotions' backs are turned. Sadness ends up touching things and inadvertently causes her and Joy to get sucked out of the control room and dumped in this remote area of uh, Riley's memories, long-term memory, where they have to figure out how to get back to the control room. Now, think for a moment. Joy and sadness are gone. Think about which emotions are left in charge of the control room. <laughs> These guys. Fear, anger, and there's fear hyperventilating, right? Fear, <laughs> anger, and disgust are left in charge of the control room. Great, right? This is going to end well, right? And this is where the wheels really start to come off. Riley has just lost whatever emotional equilibrium she once had. Even when Joy was dominating and trying to run the show and keep sadness from touching anything at all, at least all of the emotions were where they were supposed to be. But now she's totally out of balance. She starts yelling at her parents. She gets angry at her best friend back in Minnesota because she made a new friend after Riley moved away. She tries to get on a hockey team in San Francisco and keeps making mistakes and she gives up on it. And finally, she lies to her parents, <clears throat> she steals a credit card and thinks that she's going to get on a bus and run away back to Minnesota where everything's going to be happy again. Anger, disgust, and fear are running the show. They're doing the best job they can. That's all they know how to do. And all of these changes in Riley's behavior are causing different parts of her personality to crumble. These personality islands start to crumble and collapse. The islands of friendship, family, and honesty start to fall apart. And even the goofball part of her personality crumbles because she's become so serious and almost to the point of depression because she reaches the point where she can't feel anymore. She can't feel anymore. One of the big messages in this movie is that sadness isn't necessarily depression. Depression in this country over the years has been stigmatized. And a lot of people associate sadness with depression. Sadness isn't necessarily depression. And when we try to snuff or stuff our feelings of sadness, it can have some negative and unintended consequences. In Riley's case, the key parts of her personality are falling apart. And as that happens, it's making it more and more difficult for joy and sadness to get back to the control room. As soon as they have a way forward, something crumbles and they're more lost than ever. But then joy starts to notice something interesting. She notices that sadness actually has some pretty good ideas. She has some really good ideas about what they should be doing and where they should be going to get back to the control room. One of the uh, scenes that I really, I really like is the one where Riley has gone to sleep. And in order for joy and sadness to continue on their journey, they need Riley to be awake. So Joy thinks, well, we're going to we'll give her a dream. And of course, it's going to be a, a, a funny, positive dream, right? Thinking that that's going to wake Riley up. Sadness thinks that a scary dream would do a better job of waking Riley up. And of course, Joy would never want to scare Riley. But it turns out that sadness was correct. So they go down into the subconscious, which is really interesting because it's, it's, it's symbolized as this cave with a locked door deep down below where they have to go down there and sadness says that this is where they lock up the troublemakers, right? That's the subconscious, right? That's where the troublemakers are locked up. And we don't really, we're not really aware of exactly what's in there. 
But inside Riley's subconscious, there is this psychotic birthday clown carrying a giant sledgehammer, and joy and sadness team up to release the clown, which causes, they release the clown up into dreamland, which causes fear to press the button that wakes Riley up. Anyone remember Jangles the Clown? <laughs> I think that's like a cross between these next two characters here. This uh, cross between Gallagher, remember Gallagher with the giant sledgehammer? And uh, remember Pennywise the Clown from that Stephen King movie? You know, it's, 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 anyone else get creeped out by clowns? Does anyone have that creep out thing? It's, it's lodged in the subconscious and they actually have a name for it. You can get diagnosed for this. It's called colorophobia. Fear of clowns, right? It starts early and then it gets lodged in the subconscious and it comes back out at times when we least expect it. And that's kind of a that's a good that's a good analogy there. Okay, so the story continues. On the journey back to the control room, joy and sadness get separated for a while, and joy really starts to learn how sadness had helped Riley in the past. Um, the way that sadness helped Riley was by making her more authentic, by making her more empathetic, and in turn drawing that empathy and compassion to herself. She became more authentic, which in turn led to people around her having more empathy and then stepping up to support her during difficult times. Now in the movie, they use this example of a time when Riley missed the winning shot during a hockey game back home in Minnesota. And when Joy looked at that, all she could see, all she could see was this happy memory of Riley's teammates lifting her up on their shoulders. And it looked like they were celebrating with her when in fact what had really happened was her teammates saw Riley sitting in a tree crying and sulking because she was sad, because she'd missed the winning shot. And they decided to let her know it's okay. They were still with her, they still wanted her on the team, and uh, it turned out to be one of those bittersweet memories that was actually touched by both sadness and joy. That's realistic. That's real life. And this is the point where the, uh, the proverbial light bulb goes on. Joy realizes that sadness has a really important role to play. So when they get back to headquarters, joy actually lets sadness take the controls. <laughs> and uh, at that point, Riley gets off the bus, decides that this is not a good idea. She goes back to her parents where she is authentic. She lets her true feelings through. She's honest and authentic, and she tells her parents that she's sad, that she really, really misses her old life in Minnesota. Comes to find out she's not alone. Her parents miss a lot of things, too. They talk about it together, and soon these crumbling islands of Riley's personality start to come back. Now, they're, they're different than they were before, but in many ways, they're better. And so the movie concludes with all of the emotions agreeing that they can work together to help Riley to lead what is a truly happy and balanced life. That's the story. It isn't just about joy. Every emotion has an important role to play. Disgust keeps her safe uh, from toxins, things that are icky that might hurt her. Fear helps to keep her safe from things that are dangerous. Anger is the motivator. Anger is what helps people to step up, gives you the energy to do the right things. And of course, joy is there to help us keep that balance. Every emotion has its purpose to serve. And I think it's really I think it's really great that they aim this at children and adults both because there's a great lesson for children to learn. Um, what's happening here is that uh, with, without coming right out and saying so, and, th and this is my opinion on the movie, I think that this movie is giving us an in-depth lesson in something called emotional intelligence. You heard of emotional intelligence? Something that's been around since 19... 64, and it was made popular in 1995, there was this book written by Daniel Goleman called Emotional Intelligence, Why It Can Matter More Than 
IQ. We know that IQ isn't the only measure of intelligence. In fact, proponents of emotional intelligence use the metaphor of an iceberg to describe the relationship between IQ and emotional intelligence. It looks like this. IQ is the tip of the iceberg. Emotional intelligence, or they abbreviated EQ, is what lies below the surface. And it's difficult for people to make that journey below the surface, to go below the superficial, to make that journey within, which is why the movie is called Inside Out. Got to have both, got to be willing to go inside. We have a, a very well-known and wise author, teacher, minister in unity by the name of Eric Butterworth. And something that he has said all along is that life is lived from the inside out. That's Eric's message. The important stuff is below the waterline. So this, this next image up here really summarizes what are the basics of EQ and see, and see how this goes along with, with the movie here. Look at this. Emotional intelligence consists of these four elements we have up here. Notice they have colors too. I didn't bother sitting down trying to figure that out, but they, they use colors for them. They don't come across as well on this slide. Emotional intelligence consists of perceiving emotions, then understanding emotions. You can't understand them unless you perceive them. Perceiving, understanding, managing emotions, and then using emotions. Those together are parts of emotional intelligence. Each emotion has its place, and knowing when one needs to give way to another is a crucial skill that we have to learn. We have to learn this, and I think this movie helps with that process. What Riley and her parents go through is something that everyone should go through. Not everyone goes through it, but everyone needs to go through it on the road to becoming a more compassionate and caring human beings. We need to wake up to the stuff that's below the surface. At its highest level, emotional intelligence can also appreciate how others are going through the same thing. We're all in the same boat. At its highest level, emotional intelligence says that everyone is learning how to perceive, understand, manage, and use their own emotions. And we realize that we're not all at the same level in doing that, which means maybe sometimes we can cut someone a little slack. Relationships can be a lot better when we learn to see that. That's one of the key messages here. All of that Go figure. All of that from a cartoon, from an animated movie that's aimed at children. This should be a classic. I, I don't think there's too many things that are going to uh, make it, uh, you know, dated. I think it's going to be a classic, and uh, I think it's a wonderful, wonderful uh, learning tool and learning opportunity. Speaking of classics, I'm going to close today with a poem from the 13th century. That's a long time ago. A poem from the 13th century that I thought of when I saw this movie, and I think it kind of sums it up perfectly. It's by a fellow named Jalaladin Rumi. It's called The Guest House. This being human is a guest house. Every morning, a new arrival. A joy, a depression, a meanness. Some momentary awareness comes as an unexpected visitor. Welcome and entertain them all, even if they are a crowd of sorrows who violently sweep your house empty of its furniture. Still, treat each guest honorably. He may be clearing you out for some new delight. The dark thought, the shame, the malice, meet them at the door laughing and invite them in. Be grateful for whoever comes because each has been sent as a guide from beyond. See you next week.